Um, good morning. Welcome to the Social Market Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm James Kirkup. I'm the director of the SMF. Uh, you are, uh, I hope you know, here to uh, hear a keynote speech from uh, my guest here today, uh, Tina Stahl. Uh, but before I introduce Tina and her speech, I'm just going to qu quickly run you through the, some housekeeping about how we're going to proceed. Uh, uh, I'm sure we're all used to Zoom webinars and online sessions by now, but uh, what we'll do is we will, well, I'll hand over to, to Tina, who will speak um, formally for, I think, around about 20 minutes. Uh, then after that, I have some questions I'm going to um, put to her and we're going to have a bit of a chat for a while. Uh, and then I will hand over to all of you in the audience for your questions. Now, to ask the question um make my life easier because as you probably spotted already i'm not a master of the technology here uh, to make my life easier if you could put your questions in the q a box on zoom i'll hope at the bottom of your screen um somebody's already i think um brilliantly put one there in their room so check what it is um aha anonymous attendee says you're fine on my end not freezing thanks anonymous um so um yeah if you could use the q a box to raise your questions and i will then put those questions uh to uh, uh to tina um i think that's about all the um uh all the housekeeping um uh, i've got to do today which is quite nice so um without much further ado um i will introduce our speaker um uh who is uh baroness Stahl, tina Stahl outgoing chair of the charity commission and i'm very really pleased to have her here today to uh talk about the role of charity and regulation in a healthy uh healthy democratic society not just because the social market foundation is a uh, is a registered charity and very really proud to be so but because we are a think tank interested in the relationship between state and society public and private uh about the ways in which uh the state and uh society the public and private spheres can interact to produce the best happiest most harmonious and prosperous society. Uh, so the topics we're discussing today very close to our, our hearts as well. Uh, but uh, that is hopefully the longest bit of talking you'll hear from me for the next uh, 54 minutes because I'm fully aware that I'm not the person you came here to listen to. Uh, that person is Tina Stahl. So uh, with that I will hand over to you. Tina. Thank you very much James and good morning everyone. Um, thank you uh, for being here. And I can't think of a, a better place actually to make one of my last speeches as chair of the Charity Commission than at a registered charity. And I'm delighted that you've given me this opportunity because the Social Market Foundation has distinguished itself over the years as a meeting place where those of us of all political persuasions and none can debate freely and productively. So I will do my best to honor that tradition today. I certainly want to reflect on what I've learned in my three years as Commission Chair and to talk about what I and the whole organisation have achieved in that time to help increase the benefit of charity to society. And I will also outline the work still to do, which will fall to my successor. But more than that, I want to explain the thinking that has lain behind what we have been trying to do. We which I believe is fundamental, not just to the future viability and prosperity of the charitable sector, but also to the broader health of our society. It can be summed up briefly as this, that if charities or indeed any other institution and anybody else operating in the public eye are to survive and thrive, we are all going to have to be far more respectful of other people's points of view. Now, before I get on to charities more specifically, let me take a step back by examining the intense world in which we live and operate today. I think we can all agree that the levels of scrutiny we all face are immense. The speed with which we can pass judgment on others is unprecedented, as is the ability to seek out those who agree with us, often to the exclusion of anyone else. All of this makes outrage at scale much easier and sometimes the entire object of the exercise. Being angry seems to be the only way to make yourself heard amongst all the noise. Of course, that approach often comes at a cost. 
nuanced disagreements descend into polarized divisions. Motives are impugned. Guilt by association becomes the order of the day. People parody others and in so doing end up becoming parodies of themselves. In this environment, a better understanding of the differences between us and the actual reasons behind them has never been more difficult or more essential. The current pandemic may have frozen all of us in place for the time being, but the places we find ourselves in reflect the fact that we are perhaps more segregated than we have been in living memory, whether that is by choice or by the lack of it. Most, perhaps all of us on this call, have been to places and experienced things that people within living memory couldn't even begin to comprehend. These experiences help to shape who we are, what we think and how we feel, and they're a, a part of us. We have these things in common, but we also live alongside people who've had other experiences, who haven't had the same opportunities or who've had different ones. And yet we have seldom had less contact with those people than at any time in the modern era. So however far we travel when we can safely do so again, we really do need to get out more closer to home. That need to understand and respect experiences and values different from our own was important before the recent political shocks of the past five years. And I think it's even more important now because we have a choice. Either we acknowledge what has gone on around us, learn from it and adapt, or we ignore it as a momentary aberration, seek to learn nothing at all and just hope it won't happen again. I think choosing the latter option will be both wrong in principle and counterproductive in practice. Let me explain why and I'll draw on my own personal experience. Over my career, I have been fortunate to work in some of Britain's finest public institutions, from the civil service to the BBC. And I have served prime ministers, whether working as a member of staff inside number 10 or as a member of the cabinet. In all of these roles, the values that have mattered most are those that I share with the people I was born and brought up with in the East Midlands, close to what people nowadays call blue or red wall territory. And what are those values, those beliefs? Well, they are that rules matter and should be applied equally to everyone, that people in power have a particular responsibility to lead by example. And that knowledge, while important, of course, counts for little without understanding. These are not outlandish beliefs. They're held by millions of decent, respectable people up and down the country. And nor are the opinions they give rise to fringe or extreme. Ignoring these voices or losing touch with the values that underpin them seems to me an act of monumental hubris. And for too long, too many of us in positions of authority have allowed moral certitude, reinforced by overconfidence, to harden into disdain for other people's points of view. And that in turn has led to a reluctance to be held accountable by wider public opinion. Over the past 15 years, we've seen the consequences of that kind of attitude from the financial crisis to the scandal over MPs' expenses, and also to the loss of trust in news media. I applied for and was appointed chair of the Charity Commission because I could see that same erosion in public trust had begun to reach parts of the charity world too. Household names not behaving as they should, putting their own reputations ahead of doing the right thing, and not recognising their broader responsibility to charity as a whole has taken its toll. By 2018, public trust and confidence in charity was at its lowest level ever. Now, some organised voices opposed my appointment because of my lack of experience when it came to the charity world. But what they failed to understand was that was a feature, not a bug. I wasn't there to plead the case for charities to the public, but to make sure that a broader range of voices from the public were taken seriously by charities, especially the large and more established ones. And to do so because charity matters and it relies on everyone's support. So from the very start of my term as chair, 
I led the board and worked with Helen Stevenson, the chief executive and the rest of the executive team to place regulating in the public interest at the heart of the commission's work. This meant making us more responsive and inclusive in the way we listen and respond to different parts of the public, including volunteers and charity supporters up and down the country. We moved to reassure people that their legitimate concerns over often quite small things would not be trivialized or ignored. We also emphasized that charities needed to be driven by their purposes in the way they go about their business, not just in the difference they make. This means being respectful of basic public expectations and behaving in a way that is distinctive from other types of organizations. And I'm pleased to say that over the last couple of years, we have started to see a modest recovery in public trust and confidence in charity. And I must remind you that this is not just a nice objective if we can achieve it. It is a statutory responsibility of the Charity Commission written into law. More recently, COVID has brought home both the power of charity and its essential fragility. The power it has to harness our generosity and goodwill for the benefit of others but also how much charity relies on the support it is given as people go about our daily lives and how vulnerable it is to any disruption in those routines. As a nation, our charitable impulse runs as deep as it ever has. And over the last 12 months, people have found new and ingenious ways to demonstrate kindness, salute courage and lend practical help to one another. From supporting the inspiring endeavours of the late Captain Sir Tom Moore, who united us when we felt so far apart last spring, and whose loss this week is mourned by us all. To right now, being grateful for people like the St John Ambulance and the RVS, who are enrolling thousands of local volunteers throughout the UK to help distribute the COVID vaccine in their own communities. Indeed, many charities are having to work harder than ever, adapting to a dramatic loss of income at a time of increased demand. Having to attract new supporters or find new ways of providing essential support to those with pre-existing and ongoing needs. Charities remain the most effective way of bringing people together in the name of something bigger, more important or more urgent than those things which sometimes keep us apart. And this power that charity has derives from the feeling that it belongs to all of us in one form or another, wherever we come from. That sense of genuine common ownership is rare and precious in our current world, and we should not give it up deliberately or through neglect. Charities can challenge things, charities can shake things up, and they can even change the world, but they can't and they shouldn't go about their way to divide people. If charity is to remain at the forefront of our national life, it cannot afford to be captured by those who want to advance or defend their own view of the world to the exclusion of all others. Charities can adapt to the latest social and cultural trends, but there is a real risk of generating unnecessary controversy and division by picking sides in a battle. Some have no wish to fight. Many people seek out charities as an antidote to politics and division, not as another front on which to wage a war against political enemies. And they have the right to be respected too. Telling these people that they'll get a fair hearing if they object to the politicization of their favorite charities, or if they take a different view is not in itself a political act. It is the role of a responsible regulator. Hard as it may be to believe sometimes, away from Westminster or beyond the, the reach of Twitter, there are people who do not have definitive opinions, ready for instant expression about Brexit, the root causes of inequality, the exercise and limits to free speech, or how best to tell the story of Britain. And they are the backbone of so many of our charities. They let their donations, their volunteering, their fundraising do the talking. And just because these people do not shout doesn't mean they have no right to be heard. I have tried to make their views count more during my time at the Charity Commission, and I hope and believe my successor will do the same. They will, of course, inherit 
other challenges facing the sector and its regulator. First, public expectations matter. When it comes to charities, this means seeing motives translated into action and the job being done, uh, being gone about in the right way. Standards in terms of behaviour, efficiency and effectiveness are more important to people than structures and the public feels entitled to make certain assumptions about registered charity status that go beyond recipients simply sticking to the letter of the law. And that doesn't change even during a pandemic. Even as the range of bodies trying to become charities and the scope of things we ask charities to do keeps on growing, ensuring people's expectations are met is incredibly important if the legal and financial benefits of charitable status are to continue enjoying public support. And then there's the challenge of registered charity status itself keeping pace with the times. Charities aren't the only outlet for people who want to be charitable. The charity sector needs to embrace a new generation of organisations with their own ideas for strengthening their communities and wider society. In my view, the charity register should not be like a private members club, difficult to join, but offering a place for life once you get in. Instead, it should be a snapshot that captures the vast array of efforts being made in this country to improve lives and strengthen society at any given time. The Charity Commission would be better equipped to do this if it could make registration more straightforward in some cases, whilst at the same time have more power and greater freedom to remove from the register moribund charities or those involved in wrongdoing. And finally, there's what to do when things do go wrong. The reason why the Charity Commission has placed such importance on the public interest during my time as chair is that the way charities go about their business matters as much as the difference that they make. And how do we know this? because the public tells us so. It's important to be able to draw broader lessons from cases where appropriate to do so, to show that there is an underlying purpose to how the Charity Commission discharges its statutory responsibilities. We began to do this while I was chair and I hope that as a practice, it continues. More people are becoming aware of what the Charity Commission is trying to do on their behalf and that can only help charities who need all the support they can get to recover from the pandemic and to play their full part in helping the country to do the same. The reason charity matters is because it is a reflection of us at our best. Encapsulating our generosity of spirit, our impulse to give what we can and to do what we can to improve and enrich the lives of others whether they are on our own doorstep or thousands of miles away. And like us, charities come in all shapes and sizes, large and small, volunteer led and professionally run, service providers funded by local and national government and the essential but often unglamorous gap fillers, fiercely independent of the state. Some find this lack of coherence frustrating. They would like a much more focused, organized and coordinated sector speaking to the government and the outside world with one voice, usually their own. But looking back with the advantage of my three years at the Charity Commission, I think it is that very variation which is the source of charity strength. There are charities which bring like-minded people together, charities who unite unlike minds, different charities who want diametrically different things, Together, they can all help to improve lives and strengthen society within the legal framework of charitable status. With so much aiding and abetting polarization these days, it has been an absolute privilege to oversee one of the few unifying forces that stand for more pluralism in our lives. So to the 168,000 charities on our register, and the 700,000 trustees who are legally responsible for them and are custodians of something which is precious to us all. I would just like to end by saying to them, thank you. And thank you very much.
Tina for that. Um, uh, now, as I said, we will um, get on to uh, some questions from our audience in due course, but I, I was going to um, uh, use and abuse my privilege as chair and host of this event to, uh, to, to ask you a few questions first, if that's all right. Um, yeah. Uh, and the first thing I, I, I do want to ask. <laughs> so yeah, you know, the first thing I want to ask is really about the, the the that broad theme of your your speech about uh, the need for your argument for charities to retain the trust and confidence of the wider public. Um, and I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your points about what you know, essentially what do you understand to be the wider public. Uh, and their opinion, because it seems to me you're, you're, you're getting towards some interesting uh, ideas there about um, the values and interests of a group of people, and I, I know this is something that the, the Commission has done some work on, a group of people whose values, interests, opinions are not always aligned with uh, the prevailing views in the sort of part of the world that we we normally spend our time in. Obviously, we're not we're not currently at Westminster, um, but figuratively, we still are. Um, are you is your are you trying to say essentially that there is a your charities are part of that you know sort of bubble mentality that is still struggling to to connect to bits of public opinion out there who you know, people who feel left behind and uh, excluded from these sort of conversations? Frankly, um, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, first of all. I mean, the most important thing to say is that, um, you know, we should take account of all opinion. Um, and that's what really matters. And, and when I came to the Charity Commission, the thing which um, I was determined to do was to ensure that we as the regulator opened ourselves up to all opinion and recognised that um, there was a risk of us um, being part of a um, if you like being part of a bubble, you know, and being part of a sort of, you know, um, that part of um, the sort of um, uh, 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 sort of powerful sort of section of society, you know, that that bit of that bit of life, which is, um, um, you know, has the authority and uh, has the power to, you know, make uh, decisions that affect other people and do so in a way which doesn't take full um, full account of everybody. So all I've, all I've sought to do is to make sure that we've opened ourselves up to every kind of opinion. And what I was trying to sort of say in the speech is that, you know, we have a, we have a situation where there's a lot of people who are talking to each other all of the time and they're hearing um, uh, maybe sort of, uh, they may be getting into an angry debate with each other, but they're not recognizing that there's a big body of, a, uh, of, of people out there who are not actually participating in an angry debate. Um, what matters to them about uh, charity is that it is um, a place which is outside of that political um, argument and, and battle and that uh, it doesn't become part of it. Um, so that's the point I was making uh, in, in that context. But it's about all opinion, James, and it's, it's critical that we, that we recognize that and we don't, we don't allow ourselves to believe that there is, um, uh, you know, that there is only sort of, you know, certain groups of people that are worth uh, listening to. And I think that, you know, one of the things I, I'm, I'm keen to uh, ensure is that, you know, those who, um, you know, everybody makes charity happen. That's the critical thing. For charity to deliver maximum impact to society, you have to understand that it relies on everybody's support. And so um, what we've got to, you know, what we've got to make sure is that, you know, everybody who is contributing to this thing feels that, you know, their, you know, their expectations are taken seriously. And there are certain things which unite everybody, you know, whatever kind of background or whatever kind of opinion that they have. And, uh, and that's very much that, uh, you know, as I said in the speech, that the way charities go about their business is in line with basic expectations. And they are, you know, their expectations, which are about sort of making sure, you know, as much as the, you know, money uh, that charities uh, raise or receive goes in support of their cause, that, um, uh, that the way that they go about their work is um, uh, that they make a difference and the, the way that they go about their work 
work is um, uh, in line with what they would expect is uh, distinctive about a charity. Because the other thing which is about charity is that people, people expect it to be different and distinctive from what um, they might see from a business or even just a, uh, another public service, because it's something which is, um, uh, should be motivated in a different uh, way. And that's, that's what this is about, opening ourselves up, recognizing that there is a, you know, there's a whole body of opinion out there that, um, uh, uh, you know, must not be ignored. Now, when I'll do you to betray a small confidence, I suppose, when we were talking about you know, about doing this speech, uh, at one point I remember you mentioned um, your experience in a previous incarnation in Parliament, uh, taking legislation on equal marriage through the Lords. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, again, to frankly. Ter ter terrible illustration. I was wondering if, if, if you want to amplify on what that experience taught you about the points you're making here um, yeah, in terms of how to incorporate diverse viewpoints. Okay, well, um, I mean, I suppose... Uh, I mean, equal marriage is, a, is an example of, of how it is possible for an institution, the way in which I did, for an institution to modernise um, and to do so in a way that takes account of uh, everybody in the way it does. So if I, if I, I mean, I think one of the things which uh, charities are probably uh, concerned to ensure is that, you know, as an institution, they keep pace with modern expectations. And, and they should be able to do that, um, but they, they have to approach it in a way which um, brings everybody with them. And so at equal marriage, you know, for me, when I was the minister responsible for equal marriage, um, what was clear to me was that in order to modernize that institution uh, in the way that we were seeking to do as a government, the best way to do it in ter terms of taking the legislation through the House of Lords was to remove politics from it and respect all of the opinion, uh, and particularly those who were unsure about whether to get on board with equal ma marriage. And doing that led to a better result. I mean, we, we, we not only succeeded in making that happen, we brought more people with us. And um, so I wouldn't want anybody to, um, you know, I would want people to take from that uh, as, a, as an example and as, uh, as an illustration of how it is possible to modernize. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, as far as, you know, each charity is concerned, um, you know, every charity is set up in a way where it's clear from the start what their charitable objects are, what their charitable purpose is. Every charity should be driven by their charitable purpose and by the beneficiaries that they uh, exist to serve. They are able to campaign, absolutely. So they can campaign in support of their charitable purposes, um, but they must do so um, in a way um, which uh, is um, compatible with what people expect of a charity. And if they are trying to campaign to um, change the law or to um, uh, change some sort of public policy or to influence or change people's minds, then the best way to do that is in a way which is you know, respectful and doesn't seek to um, define anybody who is unsure uh, or in disagreement with them as to what they are trying to do as somehow a bad person. And so it is, it is absolutely to, um, able and possible for charities to operate in the way that they think is um, uh, the right, you know, when they're trying to sort of further their own objectives. But it's, it's very important that they do that in a way which is um, in line with what people would expect. If they start um, operating in a way which is similar to, you know, a sort of political um, party or um, any kind of sort of political sort of movement, then that becomes divisive and, be count, you know, is counterproductive. Thank you. Now, there, there are um, there are some two, or three, well, so several very good questions on this that topic coming in on the on the question panel, which I'll, I'll put to you later. I'm, I'm going to um, further further uh, misuse my position to uh, just try to ask you a, a couple of things uh, before we get on to uh, to audience questions. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's fair to say I think you know, that you know, some of the things you're you're saying, your points about confidence in the sector. Yeah, and your appointment, as you've noted, relatively controversial. That some people have been um, unhappy or uh, unconvinced by you know, by by the direction you've taken and, and by your appointment. I mean, did you ever? 
I mean, did, did you ever have second thoughts about doing doing this? Do you ever think, you know, maybe maybe this isn't for me? Um, well, as, as, as I said, I mean, I was, um, I was very clear why I applied for the job. Um, it wasn't, um, I, I think when after, after the uh, um, select committee hearing, when, um, uh, uh, when, I, was, uh, when I was nominated, um, when I was, it wasn't a surprise to me that, um, uh, you know, after the hearing that the committee was not supportive of my uh, appointment. And I was asked, do you still want to go ahead with this? And I said, absolutely, because, you know, I knew, um, I knew why I was um, putting myself forward and, and I knew what it was that I wanted to try and achieve. And, um, uh, and there was, you know, absolutely no way that I was going to back down from that. And, and I can see and I know that from the way in which we have um, changed and improved the way we have gone about our work at the Charity Commission, that it is achieving results. Um, so I've never had any regrets about um, sticking with it and, uh, uh, and doing the job that I've done. And, I'm, you know, I was, I, I was pleased to have the opportunity. I've, I've considered it a great privilege. Um. Uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm watching watching my various you know, my various boxes of boxes of text and, and questions piling up, which uh, suggests to me yeah politely that I I should probably shut up and start handing over to you to the questions here. But my, you know, um the last thing I'm, I'm really keen, really keen to ask you about so the you know, again there, there's a, a point in your speech when you talked about the charity register as a as a members club. Um, uh, suggesting it's you know once you once once you're in you're in and it's quite cozy and you can stay there. Here for as long as you like. I, you, you, the essence of that message, I think, is both to your your successor and to government that you think it should be easier for someone, presumably the regulator, to you know, to expel people from that club if uh, if they don't meet its standards. Is that? I mean, should should that be the future of charity regulation? More uh, more charities being being removed for for more reasons. Well, I think, I, I mean, what, what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, the charity sector itself uh, and the register needs to sort of, you know, we, it needs to be a, an agile thing. You know, it, it needs to be something that, you know, can reflect um, changing society. And um, uh, and at the moment, um, I think it, the, the, the power that we have and the ability that we have to remove charities from the register could be um, could be strengthened, could be improved. Um, I want to see a situation where the way in which um, the regulations exist um, do not encourage yet more bureaucracy, but actually sort of make it possible for us to take the right action when something goes wrong. I mean, we've done, you know, we, 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 we as far as um, things that we've done to um, uh, remove charities from the register that uh, have not been sort of operating effectively. Um, we've, uh, over the last couple of years, one of the things that we have introduced is a, is a program where we've called it revitalizing uh, trusts, where we have um, invite, you know, encouraged and targeted charities who are sitting on assets, but not doing much. Um, they're not very, you know, they're not using these assets. They're not being very productive with them. And, and sort of almost encourage them as a sort of an act of public service to come forward and uh, working with other bodies, what we've been able to do is, um, uh, is, is to sort of re, is, is to help them either sort of, you know, release those funds and um, uh, remove them from the register, but then redirect those funds by the UK Foundation uh, people to other charities with similar purposes. So we're doing a lot in this area, but I, you know, but what I think is that, um, you know, the, the, the way in which we allow charities on and the way in which we sort of are able and equipped to remove them when things go wrong and uh, charities are not being effective could be improved. And that's something that I would like to see happen in the future. Thank you. Now, we've got about just, just over 12, 20, 23 minutes left, if we're going to be precise. Um, and currently a good 14 or 15 questions um, coming in. So, um, we'll try and clip through them as quickly as we can, um, in depth, of course. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Dame Julia Unwin. Um, uh, Julia's question is, the formation of very many charities has been done in order to challenge received opinion. They support unpopular causes and are deeply connected. Does talking about the majority opinion risk denying them a place? No, absolutely not. And I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to, you know, recognise that we have on the charity register, there are some charities which um, have causes which are sort of um, 
quite universal in their appeal. And we've got charities on the register that um, you know, are dealing with uh, issues which are not necessarily um, universally popular. Um, and all of them are legitimate. They're on our register. They are absolutely legitimate charities. Um, and what, um, what is important is that, um, as I said earlier, that any charity um, is driven by its charitable purpose and its object. And that um, in campaigning in pursuit of that, what I'm saying is that if they are seeking to influence other people and attract more support, they need to do it in a way which doesn't put people off, but actually attracts um, the, uh, the, the, the support that they, they want and they need to make the changes that they believe in. So that's, very, so that's absolutely clear. The charities who have that broader, more mainstream uh, uh, charitable purpose, the thing about them is, uh, you know, if they are if they are bodies which are, um, you know, feel that they've got to, you know, uh, you know, stay um, modern and relevant, and and they they want to sort of continue to be open and inclusive to as many people as possible, there's no shortcut to that. They can't achieve that in in an easy way. There are no, um, you know, when 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 things come along that might seem um, simple solutions to that very cha challenging problem. Um, is to be very careful about using them because that's quite dangerous because what can happen then is with those charities who are really are relying on everybody's support is that um, they can then start to sort of really damage not just their own ability um, to deliver the, the benefit that they exist for, but they also then are starting to affect um, the uh, reputation of charity uh, as a whole. And what I'm saying to them, and that's why I sort of, you know, uh, point to an equal marriage uh, as an example, is that um, there is ways of modernizing yourself as an institution, but the way you do it means that you must respect everybody you are relying on um, or who feel that they have you know, a, um, a stake in your charity in the way that you do it. And what any charity um, must always remember, whether it's one of those mainstream ones or whether it's one of the charities which is quite specific in its cause, uh, and only sort of, you know, and only involved with a certain section of, of, the, uh, of the population, is that everybody is um, making charity happen in one shape or a form, and everybody, everybody's tacit support is essential for the status that each charity is relying on um, and using as a sort of, um, as a justification and, uh, uh, and the authority for them to operate. Thank you. Now, we've got a couple of um, media questions I think, on, on similar um, on similar themes. So I'm going to go to them. Um, they are from um, Crystal Hope of the Telegraph and then Patrick Butler from The Guardian. Um, so Crystal Hope of the Telegraph. Uh, do you think charities are left wing? Is there a risk that by pursuing political agendas, they could alienate their donor base? Should there be new guidance on charities to ensure they don't stray from their charitable objects into politics? For example, the National Trust on colonialism, the RSPCA on hunting, Barnardo's on white privilege. Uh, and if they breach this guidance, should they lose their charitable status? Um, well, um, I don't think, um, I mean, all charities um, uh, are on our uh, register um, legitimately. Okay, so um, you know, every, every charity that is on our register is there and has uh, an absolute uh, right to exist. And they are there with charitable purposes. And as I've already said, some of the causes that they exist to um, uh, fight for or to address may not be universally popular. They are absolutely able, um, uh, and uh, you know, our guidance makes absolutely clear, they are able to campaign in support of those objects. Um, but what they mustn't do is do so in a way which is in support of um, any kind of um, political party. But, um, and, that's, and that's clear. What, what, what we're seeing sort of now, of course, is that um, in the political arena, not everything sort of um, uh, sits neatly within a political party. Um, you know, not everything which is contentious is um, defined as, you know, a particular party's policy position on something. 
So um, in that in that respect, um, what charities have to be mindful of is that there are there are risks to um, adopting um, uh, uh, or, or getting involved in sort of, you know, particular sort of movements or causes that are outside of their objects and then start to make people question whether or not they really are entitled to um, uh, retain that status of charity, which is so important. Because as I say, supporters or not, all members of the public are contributing to um, a charity. Charity belongs to everybody because everybody is contributing to um, uh, or, or, or giving their support to that status um, uh, that, um, uh, that, that, that gives them the license to operate. That's the point. Um, so, um, and as I say, with the um, with other charities, which are sort of you know much more um, you know mainstream in their sort of uh, nature that um, you know, people want to engage with um, because they believe in the cause that they are fighting or because they want to enjoy the benefits that they exist to offer. A lot of people who do that do want to do that in a way where it's, it's not then, um, they're, not expected, they're not expecting to have to um, uh, um, you know, be uh, in receipt of some kind of propaganda you know, whilst they're there, which is completely uh, irrespective of, uh, of the nature of the cause. I think that's a very, now, seems like a very good way into Patrick Butler's question. Now, just to point out, we've got 16 minutes left on the clock and about a dozen questions left to get through. So we'll, I'll, we'll try and get, pick up the pace a bit, or, you know, or I will anyway. So Patrick Butler from The Guardian asks, these charities which, are suppo which supposedly campaign, quotes, disrespectfully, quotes, to the wider public, could you please give examples? By focusing on very subjective ideas of charity, quotes, behaviour, uh, in this way, aren't you just widening social divisions by facilitating and encouraging so-called culture wars? Um, no, uh, no, I'm not actually. Um, I mean, I'm not. You know, what is what is really important is is to remember that every that you know, charity, this, the status of charity, is something which brings with it a you know a a. a a set of um, responsibilities, um, which, as I say, are um, they're hard. They're, they're not always easy to define. But but a charity is a custodian of something which um, goes beyond just the legal le legal limits of the law. Um, and if you have that status, if you are a registered charity. What that means is, regardless of your objects, regardless what is what you exist for, it brings with it that um, responsibility that you have to understand that um, you're relying on, um, uh, you, you know, you you are relying on a um, uh, um, the goodwill of people who go way beyond those who might directly be your supporters, and if you ignore that what you are doing is not only damaging potentially your own prospects as a charity, you are damaging potentially the brand of charity that all charities are relying on. This is about, this is about what collective responsibility for um, the brand of charity means. Thank you. Now, uh, yeah, another related question from Catherine Goodall, um, I think of NCVO. Um, thank you for your speech and your work. How would you want a charity to campaign on a key issue of human rights, which is in line with their charitable objectives, but not in line with the predominant current public or political opinion and, uh, and is polarizing? Uh, for example, around issues of race or trans rights. So all I would say in response to that is you just have to be respectful of the fact that there are a wide range of views out there and what, you know, what, what, um, what, what if you are trying to attract support from people who do not already agree with you, then do it in a way which doesn't um, discourage them, do it in a way which um, gives uh, people the, um, uh, the reason to want to uh, listen to you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, I mean, if, 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 if you think about, I mean, I know, you know, lots of people sort of uh, will um, uh, 
uh, were, were, were sort of you know moved when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died a few months ago. And one of the things, you know, as a Supreme Court uh, justice, and one of the things that she was renowned for saying is, you know, fight hard for your cause, but do it in a way that others will support you, because that's how you'll be successful. And that's 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 what this is about. It's about re being respectful of others who might disagree with you or being respectful of those who have no view at all but whose support you are relying on in order to actually fight the cause that you uh, are trying to fight. I, I'm just gonna, I, I'd like to just quickly follow up on my question I suppose on that point about respect for dissenting views. Um, just bearing in mind, the question I think referred to race and trans rights um, so if I understand you, your, your point is that, say, charities working in those areas e e you know, should be respectful of people who happen to take a different view of, of, of those issues. Um, well, I, what, what I'm saying is, is that um, there are some people who will be... Um, I mean, clearly, you know, uh, racism is a bad thing. Anybody who thinks racism uh, is a good thing uh, is not somebody who is worthy of respect. But there are sort of a lot of people who, um, as I said in my speech, you know, don't have um, uh, or don't want to sort of get engaged in a sort of, uh, you know, a, a, a big debate about a matter such as that in the context of um, charity you know, it's sort of uh, more generally. Um, so, uh, but the, but so so that's why I'm saying that those who's those people who want to uh, engage with charity in a way which is um, um, uh, sort of away from sort of political struggle don't you know the fact that that that's that's what they that's the position that they take does not make them an opponent to you know what it is that you are sort of arguing for. Um, and what I'm saying about sort of, you know, a, a cause that's a human rights charity or whether it's, you know, an equality charity, if, if they are trying to encourage others to support their cause, then to be mindful of the fact that um, there are people who will not be necessarily campaigning against what you are fighting for, but there may be people who are uncertain. And the fact that they are uncertain doesn't make them a bad person, doesn't make them automatically an opponent of what you are arguing for. Um, uh, and that, that mention of uh, charities involved in race to you allows me to go on to a question from uh, Thomas Collins, I think from New Philanthropy Capital. Uh, his question is, uh, or reads, pleased to hear Baroness Stowell is interested in the commission acknowledging the work of a broader range of social benefit organisations. Would you like to see the register include organisations like Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion? Well, it would. It, I mean, they would have to um, make their. Um, uh, you know, if if they submitted an application, it would have to be um, uh, considered in the in the normal way. I mean, that's what we would do. I mean, uh, I mean, I can't. You know, I, I wouldn't want to. Um, uh, uh, you know, take a view on that. Um, I'm not the, you know, I'm not, I'm not the technical expert who would consider these things. However, um, no charity can sort of exist to, um, uh, uh, you know, the purpose of that charity cannot be to campaign. The can't, you know, there isn't a charitable purpose which is campaigning. Um, and if that so, is so the if, purpose if, if, of you as a charity, then, um, or if that is the purpose of your organisation, then that would disqualify you from becoming a charity. So if the, if the, if the thrust of that question was really, should, should the definition of charity be widened uh, you know, such that it could accommodate Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion, um, your answer seems to be no, um, that you, you're satisfied with the current the current definition of charity and, and, and those organisations would, ha would have to meet that definition in your view? Well, the, the charitable purposes that exist uh, in law are decided by Parliament, they're not decided by us. Um, and, uh, and it is our job to operate within, within those limits. Um, what I'm saying is, is that um, charity is about, you know, charity is about um, uh, uh, pursuing a sort of a, a charitable cause um, for exclusively the public benefit and that it can't be um, party political. Um, if, um, and that's just, you know, that, that's how it is. If, if, if and when, I mean, we get very difficult um, 
uh, applications that come to us all the time that uh, require you know a huge amount of consideration before they are allowed onto the register. Um, but you know the thing about you know any of the any of the uh, um, uh, you know new applicants is that you know if they are you know if 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 they are sort of ones which um, uh, are already uh, uh, established, then you know clearly sort of you know we've got to you know we've got to take account of what it is that they are doing already and whether or not that would you know be be, be perceived to be political. Um, now, a few, um, well, one last, well, several, several questions I'll try and jam in. One relatively substantive one um, which might, um, comes from Duncan Exley. Can you tell us what the data say about how demographically representative charity leaders and staff are of wider society, brackets in terms of protected characteristics and socioeconomic background, uh, close brackets, and implications of this for mutual understanding and trust between charities and wider society, especially in household name charities. I think mean, essentially, do do the people who run uh, who run charities, and particularly big charities, do they you know, do they look enough like the wider country uh, that they serve? Um, well, we did. I mean, I, before my time, uh, there was some research into uh, the diversity of um, trustees and uh, charity leaders. Um, and I mean, I think there is a, you know, I think that, I think there is a sort of, uh, you know, more recent evidence to demonstrate that there is still sort of more to be done in terms of um, that those, uh, you know, representation of characteristics such as that uh, amongst um, the charity, um, uh, the charity sector. However, what I would also argue is that, you know, we need to understand that diversity isn't just about. Um, characteristics uh, in the way that uh, has just been described and what I'm saying is that um, charity uh, is something which is uh, you know very much relies on everybody and we need to you know we need to consider everybody in the broadest sense of the word and not just be too you know not not just not just only consider uh, and uh, and focus on 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 characteristics like that. Um, I've got, um, we're fast running out of time, so uh, I'm going to go quickly to a question from Stephen Delahunty from Third Sector magazine. Uh, what does the chair say to those in the sector who thought her comments about the National Trust's purpose in October last year were politically motivated? Well, I, 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 I have not said or done anything that is politically motivated. My only concern um, throughout my time as chair is to be, uh, is to ensure that everybody who is contributing and making charity happen um, gets heard, is respected and uh, understood. Thank you. Um, um, uh, this might be a technical question to cover quickly, but we have a question from from a, a Michael Gray. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know yeah, if that's probably the, the Michael Gray. If, I don't know if that if, that's, if that that is Lord Lord, Lord Gray or um, uh, Lord Gray of the of the upper house. But he says, has the fundraising regulator made a difference? Question mark. Good, good short question. Well done. Um, yeah, I think I think the um, fundraising regulator um, has made a difference. Uh, they focus very much on the way in which charities. Um, uh, raise money. Um, it is our job as the Charity Commission to regulate uh, the money once it has been raised. So once once a charity is in receipt of money, um, it is our job to make sure that uh, in the way that we regulate that it is being used for the reasons uh, that it was donated uh, for. So, um, but having that having that separate regulator concentrating on that bit of the that, that bit of the charity world, uh, I think, has made a difference. Yes. Um... Uh, one, um, uh, well, actually, well, one, one, several questions have come in um, about rela relating to, um, uh, to to Captain Tom, um, uh, and there are lots of different permutations of the question. But I mean, I, yeah, I might just give you an, an easy one. And say very briefly, what lesson do you, do, what lesson do charities take from um, the the Captain Tom phenomenon? I would say it, what to me what Captain Tom epitomized was um, all that charity means to people. Um, it was through the way in which he um, set out to raise money and all that he said and did uh, in the time since. He's, he's, he's demonstrated that selflessness, he's demonstrated the characteristics that mean people don't question his motives. 
and um, and that to me would be the big lesson to take away from uh, Captain Tom. And and the fact that he did that was so appealing to everybody. It united all of us. And the thing about charity, um, which is so special, is that um, we can all be very different, think very, very different things, come from sort of all sorts of background. But those characteristics of wanting to help other people, that uh, charitable endeavour, that selflessness, it brings us together. And that's why it is so important that we don't put that at risk. Charity must not become collateral damage in any kind of culture war or anything else that might be happening right now. It's too precious, it's too important, and it belongs to everybody. Thank you. We're now into our last 120 seconds. So I'm going to give the last question to Kirsty Weekly of Civil Society News, who's actually asked you what I, what I was going to ask you was my last question. Very simply, uh, do you have any regrets? Um, I, I, I don't have, uh, no, I don't have um, uh, any regrets. Um, perhaps actually probably one regret, which is, um, uh, I wish I'd probably been more vocal, actually. I wished I would, I wished I would have, um, said more on behalf of um, people who have felt sometimes um, not heard or their views misunderstood and, um, and what I would say to um, my successor and to everybody involved in the charity sector um, who uh, you know works so hard to um, make a massive contribution to our society which is that you will only achieve and deliver the full benefit that you exist to deliver with the full support of everybody. So never forget that and never forget to take account of everybody uh, in the way that you do your work. Thank you very much. Now, with that, you, almost to the second, you've you stopped talking on, 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 on the stroke of 12, which is the point where we have to end this session. Um, I'm aware um, so we've had a lot of, for too many questions, I'm afraid, to put them all to you. We will, um, I promise, um, try and explore um, with the Commission and within the confines of GDPR ways of getting those questions um, uh, and the questioners' names on to, to the Commission if, in the hope that you can follow up. Uh, for those who didn't get to ask them. Uh, so with that, all I really have to say now is thank you very much. Uh, thank you all to our audience for joining us. Uh, we've had um, numbers dropping there. It was well over 100 at one point when I, we were just falling off people, people leave us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming to the Social Market Foundation. Thank you, um, but thank especially, you, especially, uh, you know, Baroness Dahl, T.S. Dahl, thank you very much for coming here and talking to us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.